Thank you for having us, everyone. Um, I'm Melody Heishen. I'm not the veteran. This one is. This is Marianna Brunkhorst. Uh, we're sisters. Our family is here as well. Uh, we come from a, a line of veterans as well. Um, our our um, grandfather retired as a lieutenant colonel. Colonel, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, and so we have a whole bunch of other relatives as well. So uh, this is not something that's um, unfamiliar to us, but this is the first chance that we've had the opportunity to work together on something that's so significant it has been in our lives. So um, we entitled the, the exhibit Sister Soldier Scene, a little double entendre right there. Um, <laughs> I myself am a watercolor and ink artist. Um, I also do shadow boxes that um, are you know symbolic and I do workshops for those as well. I have a couple of those examples up up top and I did a, a workshop here with a few of you as well. I think it was another snowy night or maybe it was the Broncos game. Um, but yeah we've been really pleased to be able to be here. So um, I'll turn it over to Marianne at the moment and I will go through after she reads her poems. Um, we have a few of them. Then uh, I will kind of explain what I was thinking <laughs> when I put in these into artwork. So it's really interesting to hear some of the stories from Vietnam era because I was a C-130 navigator and we were still flying some of the C-130s that also flew in Vietnam. So we had some of the same tales, we had some of the stories of the ones that had gotten shot up and been repaired and we were still doing it. So fast forward a lot, I was in from 2001 to 2008 um, and as a navigator I spent a couple years stationed in Japan at Yokota Air Base um, and so I flew a lot of that part of the world. And then I was also at North Carolina, and from North Carolina, I spent a lot of time in Kuwait flying in Iraq. Um, we did not fly in Afghanistan. Our planes could not make the climb gradients at that point, so we stayed pretty much on the Iraq side um, while I was in. But um, during the seven years that I was in, Mel and I are pretty close in age, and we were always super close growing up. The seven years that I was in was probably the hardest time for our relationship because of the fact that we were in such different places. And so being able to kind of gradually, years later, now that I've been out, share some of the stories, create some of the poems about my thoughts while I was in, things that happened to me, and then have her put her interpretation on them has been a really cool um, and unique experience for us. Obviously, every veteran's experience is very different. Um, and some of these poems, most of these poems were created after I got out, so looking back from a different perspective. Um, so these are my opinions, my experiences. They don't in any way like represent Broomfield veterans' view on some things, but they are from a place that I lived while I was in the military. So um, we'll talk only about a few of them. You can see a lot of them. So I'll go ahead and read this first one. Um, and uh, this one was written... So not only am I a veteran, but I am also a, um, a survivor. So my husband was a veteran and he passed away in 2010. And so this is also partly written in honor of him and going through that experience. Um, so, honor. 21 casings, bronze, oblong, deliverers of honor and death. How ironic. Empty shells full of memory yet vacant. Uniformity reduced to data, embossed metal, all that's left, so cold and barren, stripped of personality, storied humanity, just the facts. Ma'am, there's been accident that the uniforms come to break, the spirit's veneer of self-respect, reality crashing in, a flag folded, honor. I had the opportunity to work with a bunch of other survivors as well at a retreat. Um, uh, at called Holbrook Farms that is started by two people who are now um, National Guard. They were both Air Force prior to that, but that's kind of their way of giving back. So it's a little bit my story. It's also in honor of everyone who's lost someone through military in one way or another. So I'll turn it back to Mel for her picture. So um, this is a pretty recent, uh, you can pass this around if you wanted to look at it more closely. Um, it's a very recent one for me. This was one of the last I did uh, you know, and I was so, it was hard for me to encapsulate all of the significance of not only the poem, but Mariana's experience, as well as ours as a family, secondarily, with Todd's death and her service and, and those of so many others. Um, so what I really wanted to capture in here was the essence of a flag in beauty. Um, you can see that the, it's somewhat symbolic of the flag. It is folded in a, in a, softer way. Um, you can also see that the uh, casing is within here. 
it does say honor um, and empty casing remember that um, the blue is is more of just kind of the wave of emotion that goes in there but we did find joy in the yellow uh, as we progress through this experience um, so yeah you'll see it upstairs I, I um, encourage you to take a look at it a little more closely and see the details as well as um, just kind of the movement of it So this one, I won't read the poem because it's actually a short, short story. Um, but this came from my time in Kuwait. And so this was one of my last deployments when I was in Kuwait. During the time that I was there, we were at Ali al-Salam Air Base and we were never allowed to go off base. So when we weren't flying, we had a lot of downtime. Um, but it's the desert, not a lot of places to go. So there was, um, we were kind of up the hill from the Kuwaiti Air Base down below. And so there were, of course, a bunch of bunkers and some concrete um, I forget the name for them. The concrete, like, bench-looking things? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, sitting everywhere. And so um, Todd, my husband, and I would often go and sit on the edge of that because that was a place where we could just be and just talk and not constantly have, like, everybody looking at us um, and just watch. And so one of the nights that we were out there watching, this little guy, a fennec fox from the desert, came up and, like, nipped at my shoe. And so it was just this awesome, like, incredibly beautiful experience of sunset, even in the midst of being in the desert in a place that you don't usually think of as being colorful. So this is Mel's version of that poem. Kind of speaks for itself. <laughs> um, I was really, this is kind of the joy after s some of the, the deeper, um, not sorrowful, but just more intense emotions that went into the, the rest of our, our artwork. Um, so my daughters, Shay and Tess, are here as well, and Shay's favorite animal is a fox. She usually wears some ears that look like it. Um, so this was really fun for me to bring a little bit of whimsy, and the fact Mariana is basically the best auntie in the entire universe. Um, so to be able to bring in that joy as well is, is really what I wanted to do. There is, you know, the darkness of the, the sky. Um, when you read the... Um, the writing. It's not necessarily a poem, but it's just so fun and, and distinct what she puts in there. So I really wanted to capture the colors that she had described in there, as well as what you see in, in the fox's eyes and the whole overall environment. Again, it's watercolor and ink. All right, and then um, I think we've got a couple more up here. So this one is one of the first poems that I wrote. Um, and as I mentioned, I spent a lot of time in Japan. Um, I also spent a while living in Korea. Some of the tents that you were showing pictures of, we were living in those in Korea too, so i um, very familiar with that. But um, while I was in Korea, I ended up purchasing a, I don't remember, a four type, I guess, so four pictures that are all part of the same series um, that were done obviously in the very Korean style. Um, so when I was thinking of it, I was kind of thinking of the four elements, the different elements, and the element that kind of spoke to me most was metal. So I'll read metal, and then I'll let Mel kind of talk you through the art. Uh, the art. A perfect harmony of wind-fed heat and forged to usefulness. Shock and battery create not life, but potential. Trapped inside, the bearer decides whose she'll be carrying as trained. Neutrally fine-tuned to be deadly, always cutting well, honed for parting honeyed sinews, departing humanity based on ephemera. Empty metal, drains red, tarnished. As a woman, being in the military and some of the trainings that I had to go through changed me a lot. And it was really hard for me to interact with my sister and with my family when I came back. I think at one point, Mel told me I was hard. And I had never been hard before. And so this, I mean, you have to be to survive. You know, you go through survival training, resistance training, all of that. And especially as a woman, we were not allowed to have anything happen that showed weakness or showed emotion because it would come back on us um, down the road. So as that, I became hard. And it was hard for me to hear that from her, but I was also so grateful that she loved me enough to tell me that and call me on it. So this is kind of where metal came from. Hopefully you all recognize the type of knife that is. Uh, I did, I googled it, because um, I'm not familiar with the equipment that you guys uh, have to have. Um, but really, I was thinking back to that conversation we had about when Mariana, I saw a transition, you know, in her emotions and how she represented herself. Um, she is somewhat represented in the lower figure. And this, the top one is a portrait of myself, uh, kind of looking down, not necessarily like judging her, but more praying for her. Um, 
So you'll see that there is uh, a moment of, you know, breaking through between the two so I could move through the metal to help her. Um, the colors are still symbolic. I wanted to bring in that red of the drains red, of course. Um, and then, you know, bringing in the metal to what it can be softened with, with the watercolor. Um, I wanted to make sure that there was kind of a break in the, the hardness and the, the strength um, of that piece of, of uh, artillery. So um, this, also I did like these thorns because I think that I also told, called Mariana Prickly. <laughs> We have our moments. <laughs> so um, this was just like, it's a flower that is, has dried, but it also, it, it just exudes a little bit of um, power. And she is so powerful. And I wanted to bring that as well. Um, so again, I have daughters. It's really nice to see the interaction of sisters as well. And so that was kind of, this is like our, basically an intimate po portrait of our sisterhood in addition to her experience, you know, at that time. So we've got a couple more that I don't have photos for. Um, I will have photos after this one, but you guys can see them up there. So there's one entitled Dog Tags, and it actually has um, the dog tags that were my husband's um, in the painting in the shadow box as well. So it's one of Mel's shadow box creations. Um, so this is Dog Tags. Fly with them. Don't wear them. They don't burn, but may warp. So very short, and when I've read that for people before, they're like, why, why don't you wear your dog tags? As a flyer, if we wore our dog tags out and something happened, we have a rapid depressurization or so on, if the dog tags can catch on something, there's all kinds of things. It was more of a hazard that I could be caught and choked to death by wearing them. So we would wear the green flight suits and we would always have our dog tags tucked inside the little shoulder pocket that goes here. Um, so. Initially, dog tags was part of a longer work, and the feedback I got from a writing workshop that I was a part of, they said, no, no, cut it out, let it be by itself. So um, Mel has a picture of dog tags up there, like I said, and we included um, my husband's dog tags in there as part of that. And then another one um, is called Night Vision. Let me pull it up. Um, and Night Vision is the only one that actually has a C-130 in it <laughs> from Mel's creation for it. Um, when we were in the desert, um, oftentimes, you know, when you're flying back from a long day, it's dark there, you're still on NVGs, but once you climb up above a certain altitude, it's no longer a threat. So you can kind of kick back a little bit. And so oftentimes, as a navigator, um, if you're not familiar with C-130s, you've got pilot, co-pilot, flight engineer. I'm sitting back here facing sideways the whole time. But when we're at low level um, in country over Iraq where there's a threat, my job was to hang onto the side window and look out and be scanning for threats. So oftentimes I'm hanging there looking out the window. So once we would get up to a safe altitude and be coming back, I would oftentimes be one of the few people awake. Pilots and co-pilots are tired. At least one of them was awake. The others maybe you can uh, kind of chill in. So I'd pop down my NVGs and look out and just the stars that you could see were so incredible. Um, and so different, because if you've ever worn MVGs, you all know, like, everything looks green going through it. It doesn't look normal. So seeing a whole bunch of green stars in these two little circles was really cool. So this is night vision. Above the clouds, above the threat, pinpricks of light bring the illusion of peace. The cockpit is still. Day-night's end is close enough to trust to this one's safe returns. Goggles down, I peer outside at night skies, sight unseen, transformed. The green haze makes all things mysterious in the same sky we all pray to. Beauty above the chaos. Um, and Mel has a picture up there with a C-130 and some little pinpricks of light that'll show up through that. Uh, yeah, for the dog tags, it's, um, <laughs> it's basically you see what you see is what you get in there. The dog tags are central to it. Um, I also wanted to, with the background, I did some a painting of dog tags. And within there, I wrote words that were of a family. So mother, father, son, daughter. Um, because essentially, when we look at those dog tags, there's respect. But we f sometimes forget about the family behind them as well. Um, I'm not going to look at my mom right now because <laughs> that's part of it. Um, but yes, I, I thought that was important to, you know, have both of them in there as a juxtaposition of 
the practical and then the emotional within that picture. Um, there's also these silhouettes of, of individuals as well with all sorts, and uh, I wanted to you know, remind everybody of the diversity of people who serve as well. Um, and then, yes. Yes, so uh, we'll talk about next. This was literally the first one I ever did of her poems. As soon as I got her the book, which we do have an example of. Did you bring some more? Yes. Um, this was the first one I did, and the line that stuck out to me is, let's find it. The rain for which I am waiting drips light, grows greening, promises. Sunshine freshening and quenching just enough to start a seed, caress a dream. Yes, that is the rain I am awaiting. Um, not the deluge up at the top that streaks the panes in darkness, or darkens the skies. It doesn't freeze joy, it brings life as well. Uh, so you can see in the painting, this is actually, it's, everybody thinks it's an iris, it's a columbine that's been, um, the rain is coming down on it, as you can see, there, I always use symbols. Um, and then you can see like uh, the different style within the, um, like the elements on the side here. I work better when I'm looking at it. The ups and downs that are indicated within this poem are captured on that side and you can see that this is more of a stone and that columbine is rising up above that and then the rain's going to um, help it live so this was the beginning so that'll be up there as well and you guys can see the the rest of them um, yeah I'll hand it over to Marianne to actually read the whole thing <laughs> um, so both of us are from Colorado originally we were born up in Evergreen, grew up in Boulder. So Columbine, of course, our state flower is very important to us. So um, I'll read the, the, this last poem. And then after that, we'll open up if you have any questions for us or anything you're curious about the process or how it went. Um, before I read it, one of the reasons why we were so excited about the opportunity to do this is because we wanted it to start conversations. Um, it's sometimes hard. It's easy to relate to other veterans. You've been there. You've done it. They know the stories. We see it it's sometimes harder to relate to the people in our lives who haven't been over there, who haven't seen it. And this is how Mel and I were actually able to reconnect through her art, my words, and to try to find that as a way of starting a conversation. Some of the poems that we put together, we would read for our parents and they'd be like, what? When did that happen? We had no idea. So like the beauty of creativity, the beauty of expression, is that sometimes it's a way of getting at a story that's hard to tell in any other way. Um, so. With that, I'll leave you guys with our poem next. Next, I am waiting for the rain, not the deluge that streaks the panes and darkens skies, freezing joy, drowning possibility, and deadening the way. No, I am not awaiting that rain. Nor am I waiting for the misty, barely there, secretive blanket of nature's breath that hides from itself, unsure of its right to exist. No, I am not awaiting that rain either. The rain for which I am waiting drips light, grows greening, promises sunshine, freshening and quenching just enough to start a seed, caress a dream. Yes, that is the rain I am waiting. Thank you all for letting us share our work with you. So I started my business. Oh, sorry. I started my business, Hideaway Art and Craft, uh, three years ago, and my incredible husband was generous enough to convert our basement into an art studio. Um, <laughs> I've always been a drawer, <laughs> a good drawer, um, but I had I'd done like acrylic painting, and I realized that I needed to expand beyond that. I'd actually been afraid of the watercolor for a while because it's a bit unruly, and you have to decide if you want to let it flow but I was more into the sharp edges. So um, when I can bring in the definition as well as symbolic e essences of, of other um, either materials or other paints, that kind of thing, then that's what brings me like the most satisfaction in my own artwork. Of course, art is subjective. <laughs> so maybe another person likes the flow, uh, water or acrylic or whatever. Um, but again, this is what is closest to my heart, being able to expand my own talents in this way 
when she's kind of expanded my mind to her experience as well. That was that was so significant. So, thanks for asking. <laughs> oh, and also, um, I'm a counselor by nature, uh, by my profession. So again, this is why we kind of go deep into our uh, thoughts, emotions, that kind of thing, and and it's we do want to encourage that conversation. So. Um, so I've written since I was a kid. I had a teacher in sixth grade who would make us write for an hour every day in class, and we had to write even if we didn't know what to write. So I've played with stuff for a long time. Um, we recently moved our parents out of their home that they had been in for 15 years, and now they're in an apartment closer to Mel and I. Um, and we were going back through a whole bunch of stuff, and we found one of the first stories I ever wrote, and I was kind of shocked. It's super flowery and kind of crazy and lots of extra words. Um, I never thought of myself as a poet um, until I took a poetry class and then I took a writing and healing class. Um, and those two classes taught me how to read poetry, for one, and I also saw it as a way of kind of cutting right to the heart of something rather than necessarily giving a full long story. I write stories too, I haven't finished a lot of them, but um, to me, poetry, one of the beauties of it is that it can be interpreted differently depending on who's looking at it. And it's also a visual medium. So I'm not the artist that Mel is, but I can play with line breaks, I can play with how it looks on the page, and for me that's, that's been really fun to kind of explore that medium. Um, I'm currently almost done with a creative writing degree. It's my second master's. Um, and I'm, I'm in the midst of, my final project is going to be a collection of poetry and creative nonfiction kind of blended together. So it's been a journey, for sure. Um, these were some of the first ones that I ever put out to anyone. Like, I'd written plenty before that, but never thought they were any good. Um, and they really did come from that piece of, how can I share what my experience was? How can I look back at it and make sense out of it in some way that might be open to someone? And Mel was one of my first readers. So, yeah.